Chapter Ten of God's Fool by Martin Martins. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Anna Simon. Doctor Pillenaar's Revenge. For the next fifteen years, Elias Lossell lived with Johanna and a middle-aged underservant in a little cottage outside the town, where his father came and saw him daily. His stepmother came often, not daily, and his brothers came also from time to time. The under-servant changed once or twice as the years passed on. Johanna, of course, remained, and the flow of Elias's life was almost as a lowland stream under an overhanging willow. It had been decided that he should go and live thus not long after the intercourse had been re-established between him and the outside world. Judith Lossell believed to her dying day, she is dead, she died some years before the great catastrophe, that this decision was the result of the scene between her and her husband when she told him, quietly as was her manner, and without any screams or tears, that Henky and Hubby, despite their tender age, must be sent to boarding school as soon as possible, for that the gloom of Elias's presence was ruining their infant livers. Not lives, it isn't a misprint, but livers. Judith Lossell said so. Neither her printer nor her historian is responsible for what she said. If the chronicler of a woman's many words were responsible for all their foolishness, there would be more. Alas, no, there are enough broken-brained geniuses already. There would be no chronicles written at all. Judith Lossell, however, was mistaken. The decision had been taken without any regard to her opinions, and it had been taken before the great scene above mentioned came on. That the merchant had allowed his wife to fight it out under the circumstances was the result of his inability to inform her of his reasons. He was not accustomed to oppose her, and he positively preferred her to think that she had bullied him into submission. "'Anything for a quiet life,' said this town councillor, to whom everybody bent except his consort. But nonetheless, he stuck to his original resolution that Elias himself should indicate what he preferred. And this was how the matter was settled and son. Henky and Hubby had just been sent off to bed, and their mother had followed to tuck them in. The merchant went over and spoke to the child. "'You can always perceive when Johanna is in the room, or when she touches you, can you not?' he asked. "'Yes, Papa,' said Elias. And can you when your mother does so? No, Papa. And me? I? A long pause. Sometimes, Papa. And so Elias went to live with Johanna. And Johanna played with him and was his horse. Tonnerre also played with him. Henky and Hubby occasionally came by their father's orders, and they too would try to play with him. But Tonnerre did not approve of their coming, and persisted in barking at their shins. At first a master was procured for him who, without exactly giving what could be described as lessons, had instructions to slip into his conversation such scraps of the most necessary information as could be conveyed in this desultory manner. The master was quite equal to the task thus entrusted to him, and the plan would undoubtedly have worked very satisfactorily, had Elias's head been stronger. But he grew tired, and he could not remember. That was the worst of all. He could only remember what he knew by heart, what he had known for years, or what constantly repeated itself in his experience. Sometimes it almost appeared as if his development had remained stationary with the recurrence of his blindness. And then again something would come out which would prove that this was not the case. Yet he would speak of the autumnal glories of Clarence as if he had beheld them yesterday, while his teacher would vainly ask for the fiftieth time, Elias, what is the capital of France? An attempt to teach him reading and writing, according to the methods employed among the blind, proved a failure. The writing especially, with its confusing combination of dots, greatly excited and fatigued him. At the conclusion of one of these lessons, in which he had strained his powers to the uttermost in his nervous anxiety to succeed, 
he was laid prostrate by a feverish attack which caused the frightened Johanna to send for the nearest doctor, and then for Hendrik Lossel. The nearest doctor turned out to be Elias's old friend, Pillenaar. He came, magnanimously, and he was in the sick room when the merchant hurriedly entered it. You! cried Lossel, thus suddenly thrown into the presence of the man he had wronged. The doctor answered only by a repellent gesture, and continued to busy himself with his little patient. Hendrik Lossel walked away to the window, and drummed his fingers against the pane. Presently he drew near again, attracted against his will by the silent old man at the bedside. "'Why are you here?' he asked. "'I was sent for,' replied the physician quietly. "'And a physician is not in the habit of asking where they are taking him, but why he is fetched.' He spoke without looking up, and meanwhile he drew from under the patient's arm the thermometer which had been resting there, and walked with it towards the light. "'You cannot wish well to me or mine,' persisted Lossell. "'Nor can it be an agreeable thought for me that the life of one of my children is in the hands of a man who probably thinks he owes me a bad turn.' "'I am having my revenge,' said the doctor quietly as he turned back to the bed. The father walked up and down for some moments with hesitating step. Then, stopping near Pillenaar, he asked, with a visible effort, "'Do you mean that you are hurting the child?' The doctor paused in the act of measuring out some drops, and looked across at Lossel with eyes full of tranquil scorn. "'Fool,' he said. The merchant received the word right in his face like a well-aimed snowball. He started back. He was accustomed to being called Worshipful Sir. He did not speak again, till the other got ready to go. Then he followed him downstairs, and asked almost timidly, as they were nearing the hall door, "'Is the child very ill?' The doctor stopped under the lamp, in the act of shaking himself into his overcoat. "'No,' he said. "'Not now. The fever was very high when I came, but we've already got it down half a degree. Did I not tell you I was having my revenge? The boy will get better, Meneer Lossel, but there will be no more lessons for him. His nurse tells me he is learning to read and write. I shall stop that. I have told her so. I shall give publicity to the facts that I found your son in this condition, and that I have forbidden your continuing to improve his mind. And if I find that you disregard my advice— I shall make public that little conversation of ours, which led to your nearly ruining me in the mortgage affair. I have never mentioned it to any one yet, but I shan't allow you to make away with this unfortunate son of yours. Did not I tell you that I was having my revenge? Good night. Stop! cried the wretched father, roused by these unmerited yet excusable taunts. You wrong me. Before God, you wrong me. It was no intention of mine to hurt the child. I do not deny that I would rather he had died when he was first stricken down. It would have been happier, above all for him. If you think three years of wretchedness have been preferable, I cannot help differing from you. I was angry with you chiefly for your manner. I was unreasonable, I admit it. But I have never lifted a hand against one hair of his head, neither then nor since. The doctor had stood curiously watching Hendrik Lossel's face. No, he said, when the merchant ceased speaking. I dare say not. You are not one of those who kill, only one of those who cause to die. I can't fathom your whys and your wherefores, right worshipful Heer Lossel, but I know that, for some reason or other, you would rather have that poor unfortunate out of the way. Do you dare deny it? The merchant winced. If Providence thought fit to call him to a happier sphere, he answered. Once more, who would dare wish for his remaining here? Providence, interrupted the old doctor testily. Providence, that is only another word for timely foresight. Your providence provides for yourself, Minnie Lossel, but I advise it to look out. I swear that it is false, 
cried Lossell hotly. And to prove to you that you wrong me, as well as to shield myself from your attacks, I will follow your instructions in all things concerning the boy. Nobody else shall touch him in future. He's always retained a liking for you. Doctor him as much as you choose, and revenge yourself for any wrong I may have done you, by charging me whatever sum you may please. Do you accept? The tea merchant was indeed roused to an unusual pitch of agitation, or he would never have committed himself to so rash a proposal. But he was growing old, with worry, more than with years, and his arithmetic was no longer as hard and fast as it used to be. "'I accept,' said Dr. Pillenaar, after a moment's hesitation, "'for the child's sake. My charge is a dollar a visit, and you know it.' No more lessons, no more struggling after fleeting images that ran and ran the harder he strove to retain them. Repose and fresh air and tranquil enjoyments, and then a blissful feeling as if the ache were almost gone. It was Dr. Pillenaar who called in another great medicine man to come and see Elias, not an oculist this time, but a learned professor of psychiatry. Very few people in Koopstad knew what was meant by psychiatry. It may be doubted whether the wise man himself did, though he was professor of it. An impression got about, however, that a phrenologist had been sent for to feel Elias's bumps, and Koopstad was perfectly satisfied, though some people did say they would never have thought it of Dr. Pillenaar. "'Elias has had one bump on his head, I should think, which could explain the whole matter,' said Henke. Henke was an unfeeling lad. Habi looked away. He did not like people to speak of that terrible story, which was so old, and yet daily so new. "'It is the brain,' said the professor, saying nothing new, but charging a couple of hundred florins for saying it, and therein will ever lie a subtle comfort for those of us who can afford to pay for it, and especially for those who can't. "'It is the brain. There is undoubtedly a permanent lesion, and probably in connection with that, as an outcome, yes, I should say, as an outcome of it, he frowned deeply, a slow malformation of the brain. Has this deterioration ceased, or has it not? That, honoured colleague, is the question which, if I understand aright, you are desirous of seeing solved. Pilnar nodded acquiescence, a little impatiently. It is a question requiring mature consideration, and requiring, above all, as many data as can possibly be procured. Let us, um, have luncheon first, and then we can talk the whole matter over at our ease, as, if we reckon half an hour for the meal, I shall still have twenty minutes till my train leaves for, um, home." They called in Hendrik Lossel as soon as their conference had been hurried over, and they told him the result. Nothing could be settled with any degree of certainty. On the whole, it was probable, judging by the experience of the last years, that the boy's brain would still suffer further derangement. It might safely be assumed, however, that such alteration, if it did occur, would manifest itself very tardily. Years might elapse before any noticeable change took place. On the other hand, the patient might— The professor paused and glanced inquiringly from the father to Dr. Pillenaar. The latter motioned to him to proceed. The patient might lose other senses, as he had already lost these. The eyes were sound, the ears were intact. The mischief, therefore, lay in the channels of communication between these organs and the central consciousness. It was possible, however, that the work of destruction had now come to a standstill. It was also possible that, if it continued, the patient might lapse into idiocy. Dr. Pillenaar nodded. The great man did not think this was likely, too long a period having already elapsed. More could not be said with certainty. But what had been said before was certain, taking the accompanying restrictions into account. And, if the cab was waiting, thank you, perhaps it would be better to wake the cabman. 
"'I understand,' said Lossell, confusedly following the great light of science, "'that only the brain is diseased.' "'Certainly, undoubtedly, probably, of course. The constitution is healthy, not absolutely robust, but far from unsound. Rather the reverse, remarkably sound. With care the child may live to be a hundred. It is this very fact of his general healthiness that proves there must be some local flaw. Then could we not, stammered the merchant on the steps, could we not, as I see the great doctors do in Vienna, with stomachs, you know, insert new ones of, of pigskin, it's in all the papers, could we not renovate the diseased part of the brain, remove it, you know, and, and insert new piece? professor pigs brains queried the professor his cab was coming up to the front steps well hardly and what use would they be to your son my dear sir if he had them how could he become a doctor or a lawyer or a parson with the brains of a pig i don't want him to become that said hendrik lossell innocently pursuing his direct line of thought without deferring to his companions I want him to become a merchant like myself. No, no, he would only do for a doctor, interposed Pillenaar bitterly. We have not got quite as far as that yet, said the student of the human soul, seen from the outside, as he settled himself in his conveyance. Nor has the Vienna doctor, whatever he may do in ten years' time. But we've done great things, nonetheless, in psychiatry. Very great things indeed considering he added complacently that nobody ever did anything before us and what have you done asked lossell thinking discontentedly of his departed banknotes the open carriage door in his hand we have classified my dear sir we have classified and we have found a great number of people to be mad whom nobody ever imagined to be mad before and have you asked lossell found a good many so-called mad people to be sane well no hardly that replied the psychiater somewhat taken aback hardly that no i should scarcely say that would you tell him to drive to the northern station thank you i am much obliged to you i have not the slightest doubt your boy will do very well indeed the carriage drove away. "'We've been born too early,' said Lossell sadly, as he turned into the house. "'It is our misfortune. If we'd only lived twenty years later, the doctors would have spoken of a new brain for Elias, as the parsons now speak of a new heart, and he would have been a good man of business yet, and all would have been well.' He sighed heavily. "'And now all is wrong.' he said. End of chapter 10